Welcome to this PowerPoint presentation on nonverbal communication. In our interactions with each other, it's often the stuff that we're not saying in words that carries the most weight. So this uh, presentation is going to be devoted to all of these other things that are so important in communication, but we rarely speak about it. And nonverbal communication matters. Um, if there's a conflict between what a person is saying verbally and what their nonverbal behaviors are saying, uh, research shows that we tend to believe the nonverbal behaviors more than the verbal behaviors. So we're going to explore some of the ins and outs of nonverbal communication. And some of this nonverbal communication actually does have to do with the voice, but we are communicating things through the tension in our voice. Uh, you can tell the emotions that somebody's feeling from the uh, tone of their voice, um, the way we accent words, how loudly we speak, the pitch, the voice quality, all of these send signals. So for example, if I have a student in my class that I'm good friends with and his name is John, and he says something that um, mildly irritates me in front of the class, I'll say, John, I'm gonna kill you. Now, uh, hopefully by the way I say that, people don't recoil in horror and think that John is about to be murdered in front of them. Hopefully the inflections in my voice and the way I said it indicated that it was just a manner of speaking and that I didn't really intend to do this. But this is one of the ways we get in trouble when we rely on text messages and emails because the things we can do to qualify what we say non-verbally disappear. So if you just looked at an email description of the classroom situation I just described, professor says to John, I am going to kill you. Uh, the whole thing can be perceived quite differently. So some nonverbal communication actually does take place through the voice, although it doesn't uh, rely on the meanings of the words that are being spoken. We also communicate with others uh, by the way we manage what we call our personal space. Personal space is that area immediately around your body that uh, is a zone that other people are not allowed to come into. Um, and it's stressful if people do in, invade your personal space. And your person, personal space follows you around. When I walk from one side of the room to the other, my personal space doesn't stay behind me. It travels with my body. So think of the personal space sort of like a bubble or a wrapper around the, the person. Now this slide illustrates the fact that it isn't only human beings that um, maintain predictable spaces between each other in certain situations. Contrast this with this ancient picture taken on the gizmo patio that shows Knox students maintaining spacing that looks very much like the birds on the telephone wire. One of the pioneers in the study of personal space was an anthropologist by the name of Edward Hall. And in his research, he identified different interaction distances that Americans typically use. Intimate distance. Uh, this, this is if you're interacting with somebody at a distance of less than 18 inches. This is a, a distance that's not considered appropriate to use in public. This would be the uh, distance two lovers might use, um, but you're not, public displays of affection are not typically uh, something people like. Personal distance, somewhere between one and a half to four feet. It's possible to reach out and touch the other person. This is the distance you probably use when you're interacting with friends of yours. Social distance, uh, four to 12 feet. Um, this is the distance you use in more impersonal business situations, uh, dealing with somebody who isn't really a friend in a more formal setting. And public distance, 12 to 25 feet. This is uh, the distance we try to keep between ourselves and strangers in public places, or if you were uh, listening to a public fee uh, figure give a speech or some important person, uh, we tend to be deferential and give them a larger degree of space. So you can think about the distances we keep between people as a way of signaling something about the level of intimacy we have uh, with the person we're interacting with. So once again, to quickly review, intimate distance, 
personal distance, social distance, and public distance. So yes, personal space is like this bubble that we keep around ourselves, and it's a way of managing relationships, a way of managing communication. And personal space um, functions in a variety of different ways. First of all, violations of space are stressful. So we go out of our way to avoid invading the personal space of other people, um, unless we absolutely have to, and we become uncomfortable when other people stand too close to us or sit too close to us, especially in situations where it looks like this really isn't necessary or shouldn't be necessary. Our personal spaces grow larger or smaller with circumstances. So a person uh, standing only a foot away from you would cause you to be very uncomfortable if you're standing on a street corner waiting for the light to change and there's lots of space and somebody comes and stands that close to you. Uh, on the other hand, if you're in a crowded elevator and people are packing themselves in there, uh, you don't feel that uncomfortable that somebody's a foot away because your personal space has shrunken up in that situation. We understand that in that situation, we can't have as much space available to us as usual. Our personal spaces are usually larger behind us than in front of us. We're uncomfortable if people are sneaking up behind us. And everybody keeps males farther away than, than females. Males are simply more threatening. And um, females are actually more likely to use interaction distance as an indicator of how much they like the person they're dealing with. Males just sort of plant themselves there and interact at whatever distance, um, regardless of their feelings about the person. Females are much more likely to manipulate that distance as a way of uh, indicating how they feel about the person. We will talk more about sex differences in nonverbal behaviors in a different presentation. Uh, but personal space uh, serves some important functions for us. Um, so you can think of it as a body buffer zone. It's a way of protecting us from threats of some sort. Uh, it gives us room to escape if need be. Um, and therefore, our personal space needs are greatest in situations where we feel as if uh, escape would be difficult if, uh, if we had to escape. So if you're sitting in a corner in a small room and you feel enclosed, the ceiling is low, your personal space needs are going to be much greater because you feel sort of trapped there and you know that it would be harder to escape. Whereas if you're in a wide open space uh, where there's lots of room around you, your personal space needs are not quite so great. We adjust our uh, interaction distance and personal space to adjust sensory input. So um, if somebody is wearing too much perfume or cologne, or they've got very bright colors on their clothing, uh, we might stand a little further away from them as a way of minimizing uh, the sensory impact of that individual. And personal space is very much involved with communicating and regulating how much intimacy we wanna have with other people. When psychologists use the term intimacy, they just mean how involved are you with another person? In normal everyday life, we think of intimacy as a positive thing. You're romantically attracted to someone and you want to uh, be alone with them and kiss them and touch them. And um, yes, that is a form of intimacy, but two people who are engaged in a violent altercation and strangling each other, they're very close together uh, psychologists would also think of this as intimacy. So think of intimacy as how involved are you with this other person? Personal space is part of a larger set of nonverbal behaviors that are responsible for regulating the level of intimacy we have in an interaction. And these behaviors are called immediacy behaviors. Nonverbal immediacy behaviors include things like smiling, eye contact, interpersonal distance, body orientation, touching, and posture. Now every society has rules for exactly how these behaviors 
um, ought to be used by people in public situations. Um, in another PowerPoint presentation, I'm going to talk about cultural differences in nonverbal communication. Uh, but for the time being, I'm going to set that aside and just talk about how these function. And there are rules about how each and every one of these things happen. So, for example, eye contact, mutual gaze is considered um, a very intimate kind of behavior. And we get uncomfortable if we maintain eye contact with a stranger a little bit uh, too long. Now, you've all had that experience, I'm sure. And there are rules about how much eye contact is appropriate. So if you're having a conversation with somebody, uh, you spend less time looking at the person when you're talking than when you're speaking. So when you're speaking, you look away a lot of the time and you check back in to make sure that the person is still listening or to make sure they understand what you're saying. Um, but you don't look at them fixedly. On the other hand, if you're listening in the conversation, you spend more time looking at the person who's talking than you do when you're, you yourself are talking. But all of these behaviors work together to maintain a certain level of intimacy. So um, if one of them changes, like if somebody moves too close to you and you can't step back because your back is already against a wall, you will decrease the intimacy of the interaction by compensating for that by uh, changing some of the other nonverbal behaviors. So now the interpersonal distance is closer, you look at the person less or you orient your body away from the individual so you're not facing them directly. So the entire system works together. And increasing the intimacy of nonverbal immediacy behaviors raises arousal levels. It turns up the volume on whatever is going on in an interaction. So close interaction distance, more direct body orientation, more touching, more eye contact, all of these things signal a high level of intimacy, like you see in this picture here. And that makes a pleasant situation even more pleasant. So in this case, if you have two people who are attracted to each other, um, their mutual feelings of attraction become more intense and more pleasurable as they increase the intimacy of their nonverbal behavior. On the other hand, in this picture, the eye contact, the very close face-to-face -face interaction distance, the direct body orientation. These are all highly intimate behaviors, but what they're doing is turning up the volume on the hostility, on the struggle for dominance that's going on between these two boxers before a match takes place. The most popular theory for describing how these immediacy behaviors work was developed in 1965 by a couple of researchers named Argyle and Dean. They called their theory affiliative conflict theory because they believed that every interaction between people was a conflict between two opposing tendencies. On the one hand, you're drawn toward the person. You want to establish rapport with them. You want to know them and understand them. You want to be able to communicate with them clearly. You want them to like you. So these forces all draw you together. On the other hand, there are forces that push you apart. Your fear of rejection, uh, the discomfort you experience with arousal levels that might be too high. Um, there are a variety of things that will try to keep you apart. So when two people begin to interact with each other, there's this brief period of time that some have compared to a dance where you jockey around in physical space and orient your bodies until you reach a point that's comfortable. And Argyle and Dean called this the equilibrium point. Uh, so the amount of eye contact, the interpersonal distance and everything is just right. And according to Argyle and Dean, if one of the people in the interaction departs from this equilibrium point by becoming more or less intimate, they step back or they step forward. Uh, in either case, the other person will compensate for this. They will try to restore the uh, previous equilibrium point by uh, compensating for the behavior of the other person. So if somebody steps away from me, I may move closer to them, I may follow them, or I may increase the amount of eye contact that I'm using to maintain the level of intimacy in the interaction that I'm comfortable with. So Argyle and Dean propose that in any uh, situation like this, 
When one person changes their level of intimacy, the other person will compensate for it. Early studies supporting um, the Argyle and Dean model uh, were pretty supportive. They um, did find that most of the time when you put people together in an interaction and one of the individuals changes the intimacy level of their behaviors, the other person usually does compensate for that. However, there were situations where people didn't compensate, they reciprocated. So if one person increased the uh, intimacy of the behaviors, the other person would reciprocate that and also increase the intimacy. So the intimacy level of the entire interaction goes up. Or conversely, if one person starts to withdraw, the other person may match that by withdrawing as well. Another model that tries to explain why this occurs was developed by a psychologist named Miles Patterson. And Patterson's arousal model of nonverbal intimacy is uh, a way of explaining why um, reciprocation rather than compensation might sometime occur. According to Patterson, one of the things Argyle and Dean neglected to talk about was the fact that our arousal levels change when the intimacy of our uh, partner's nonverbal behaviors change when we're interacting with them. And so, um, according to Patterson, the key thing here is how do we evaluate the arousal change that we're experiencing? If somebody increases their intimacy, they're looking at me more, they're standing closer. If I evaluate the arousal change that occurs positively, oh, I like this, I will reciprocate. On the other hand, if uh, I evaluate it negatively, oh, this is unpleasant, I'm uncomfortable, then I will compensate for that. And in the original studies uh, that Argyle and Dean were doing, they were usually bringing strangers into the laboratory and asking them to interact with each other. And this created a situation where most of the time, intimacy changes would be perceived in a negative way. But in real life, very often, we will be happy to reciprocate a positive, more intimate behaviors with someone we're attracted to, and we'll be equally likely to reciprocate uh, the withdrawal of intimacy from people that we uh, do not want to be terribly intimate with. So the Argyle and Dean model is still useful, but the Patterson arousal model of nonverbal intimacy um, makes it a little more precise by explaining how our evaluation of arousal changes is the thing that determines how we respond to changes in another person's nonverbal behavior. Nonverbal behaviors are also an important way of helping us regulate um, social interaction, especially conversation. Think about how complicated a conversation between two people is. Uh, most of the time, the people are not speaking over each other, and they very quickly go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and understand when it's their turn to speak, when it's not their turn to speak, and um, how do we manage this so smoothly? Well, it turns out there are a number of nonverbal things that control how interaction takes place. And when people really click, uh, they're engaged in something that's known as interactional synchrony. Interactional synchrony means the people have lapsed into this rhythm where they really do understand each other. And it can be a very exhilarating, um, exciting kind of experience. You really click with the person. Most of the time, you're not conscious of exactly what it is that's working, but the fact that the interaction is so smooth and effortless is what's going on. So um, one of the things that happens is people who are um, in a cohesive group reciprocate postures. If one person leans back and kind of puts their hands behind their head, uh, before long, you'll notice other people in the group doing that. Mimicking the posture of other people is a way of building cohesiveness. If you're speaking and you're ready to stop speaking, uh, there are a number of ways in which you signal that. You uh, decrease the loudness with which you speak. You slow down the language and draw out that last syllable. Um, and you have an unfilled pause and you stop gesturing and you look at the, the, your partner. So all of these things happen at once and that individual knows it's time for them to speak. Now, if I'm speaking and the other person is signaling 
that they want to get into the conversation and they want to say something, there are all kinds of things I can do to signal that I'm not ready to stop talking yet. I can increase the loudness with which I'm speaking. I make sure that there aren't any unfilled pauses. I keep gesturing. I may, might even touch the person or hold my hand out like a wait, wait kind of signal uh, that I see that you want to talk, just give me another moment. Or you can look away by averting gaze. Uh, what you're doing is um, preventing yourself from seeing those signals that tell you the other person wants to speak. And it sort of gives you an excuse to not give up the floor. Now, if you're trying to request a turn to speak, if you're the one that's anxiously waiting to get a word in, you might almost raise your hand the way a student does in a class. You draw a breath in, you inhale, your posture gets more tight and straight and um, less relaxed. You might start uh, touching your hair or yanking at your clothing, uh, nodding your head rapidly. All of these are signals that, yeah, 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 I hear what you have to say, I want to say something too. And uh, if you don't really want to speak, even when the other person seems to be turning it over to you, you just stay relaxed, uh, don't look the person in the eye and stay silent. And uh, this is a signal that, well, I've got nothing more to say. Now, all of this is pretty complicated, and yet we do it so effortlessly and quickly. And uh, people with good social skills are people that are especially adept at using these kinds of uh, behaviors to manage their conversations. Another kind of interactional synchrony uh, that can make relationships kind of move more smoothly and make them more fun is something known as quasi-courtship behavior. Um, this is behavior that occurs between two people who might consider each other to be potential romantic partners, but they aren't really interested in that. Uh, in a way, it's kind of like a harmless flirting where each partner understands that the other person isn't genuinely interested in them, but it's a playful, uh, energetic kind of interaction that makes the whole thing more fun. And um, courtship, quasi-courtship behavior uh, is a way of uh, sort of enhancing your ability to work well with someone. There are several different stages of quasi-courtship behavior. The first one is courtship readiness. Um, a person kind of has to be in the mood, so to speak, but it's not a conscious thing at all. People are often unaware that they're in the state of courtship readiness, and others who might feel kind of sexually active and interested may not actually uh, be exhibiting the kind of readiness that we're talking about here. But some of its indicators are uh, a person's muscle tone increases, uh, sagginess disappears, jolliness and bagginess around the eyes decrease, uh, your torso becomes more uh, sort of taut and erect, you don't slump, um, the muscles in your legs tighten up, your eyes uh, get brighter, uh, they sparkle, if you will. Uh, some women even believe that their hair changes texture and that their skin color may vary a little bit. Uh, courtship readiness is often also accompanied by what we call preening behaviors. Um, people start stroking their hair or rearranging their clothing. Uh, they might glance at themselves in a mirror or a window nearby because they're conscious of wanting to look good. So if a person is in a, a state of courtship readiness, then you begin what's called positioning for courtship. The partners assume certain postures. Their bodies and heads face each other directly. You lean forward. You kind of position your chairs uh, and orient your body to kind of block other people out of the interaction. And this can be followed by actions of invitation or appeal, which is just kind of a fancy way of saying flirting. Um, flirtatious glances, holding on to eye contact a little longer than normal. Um, for women, crossing legs and exposing the thigh a little bit, placing their hands on the hips. Um, there are all kinds of ways of doing this. And if conversation is involved, uh, you're using appropriate paralinguistic cues as well. Interestingly, a lot of the uh, stuff we're talking about here with quasi-courtship behaviors has been studied in psychotherapy sessions. Apparently, this is a very common pattern of behaviors for therapists and their clients to start uh, exhibiting toward each other. Now, 
If we stopped right here, it would be hard to tell the difference between quasi-courtship and actual courtship behaviors. So, the final piece of the puzzle is to have what we call qualifiers of courtship behaviors. This is a form of metacommunication. Metacommunication is a communication about a communication. So in some way you have to communicate that these nonverbal communication behaviors that you're using aren't the real deal. So maybe you're signaling somehow that, yeah, it looks like we're flirting here, but I and you both know that we're not really seriously pursuing this. So you might refer to the inappropriate context. Uh, you know, like maybe you're both married to other people and you start joking about uh, what would your partners think if they saw you sitting here talking like this. Or you exhibit some of the postural involvement cues, but not all of them. So maybe you're engaging in a lot of eye contact and flirtatious behavior, but you're opening up this interaction so that it would be very easy for another person, let's say you're at a party, to sort of join you and uh, you're not making the relationship exclusive. Or you, um, you know, do something paralinguistically to indicate, well, you know, we're just kind of playing around here. But somehow or other, one has to signal that this isn't real courtship behavior. And I'm sure that misunderstandings occur all of the time, where one person is just engaging in quasi-courtship, but the other person misinterprets it as the real thing. But quasi-courtship behaviors uh, between people who know each other well and understand the rules can make um, interactions in the workplace uh, more fun and um, you know, more productive.